Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is a book club episode presented by your brothers in Christ, Nick and Peter from the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today's book club episode will be with Dr. Stephen Myers, who Peter will further introduce here in a moment. He's going to be talking about his new book, God to Us, Covenant Theology and Scripture, published by Reformation Heritage Books. As a reminder, there are a few links in our show notes that you guys should take a look at. One of them is the Society of Reformed Podcasters, the group that we are a member of with other podcasts out there, and another couple links to find a confessionally reformed church near you, and of course, a link to today's book so you can purchase a copy for yourself. So, okay, well, here we go. We'll jump in. Yeah, so we got Dr. Stephen Myers. He's the professor uh, of systematic theology. He's also in the uh, PhD program professor as well. Um, he's our first professor from Puritan Reform, so we're glad to have somebody from Puritan Reformed on the show. Uh, and he's written a couple other books. He's written a couple other monographs, associate professor of historical theology for Puritan Reformed. And obviously, most recently, what's coming out when this podcast comes out this week, author of God to Us, uh, a covenant theology in scripture. And so we're excited to have him on the show and talk about his unique contribution to covenant theology overall. So thanks for coming on, Dr. Myers. Thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, spend some time with y'all uh, talking about these things. Sounds good. Yeah, we're getting a lot of good accents on the show. Lots of <laughs> yeah. we've, had, we've had all around the world different accents. So uh, what, describe your accent to the, to the world because we have a worldwide <laughs> audience here. It, it's a uh, technically linguistically considered the the voice of the angels. Um, <laughs> yes. If, if you want to locate it geographically, it's uh, I'm I was born and raised in North Carolina, so it's a uh, I guess a central North Carolina accent. Gotcha. So you're, you're saying you were caught up in the third heavens like Paul, and then you just picked up the accent. I, it it was an amazing experience. Uh, I'll tell you about it, but I can't. <laughs> exactly. This is an audio only show, but for the view for the listeners, where we can see you right now on the camera, it looks like a halo above your head. But it, it is the it is the light in your in your room. It's just the light above your head. Yeah, I'm sure you initially thought it was the lighting in the room, but you, you're, <laughs> it's, you're it's that third heaven's coming down. It's like Moses with the shining face. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, no, nothing quite so great, I'm afraid. <laughs> gotcha. So I can maybe start off with a, with a question on, so why, and this may sound like an obvious question, but why another book on covenant theology kind of amidst all the other works specific on covenant theology? What's, what are you hoping that you can provide that's unique to this contribution to people who are learning about covenant theology? Well, um, over the last... Uh, number of years uh, I have had opportunity to teach on covenant theology quite frequently uh, in a number of different contexts uh, in seminary classroom, you know, workshops at churches, uh, you know, preaching through uh, books of the scripture uh, as pastor, um, it, it have dealt with covenant theology in, in a number of different ways. And I've, I've never had a book that if someone said, oh, I want to learn more about covenant theology or I really want to look at this aspect of covenant theology. What should I read? I, I never had a, one specific book that I, that I could say, this is the one. And so I decided, you know, have some time on my hands. Uh, I'll try and write <laughs> that book. And I wanted to, to write one that you know, gives you a, a sense of the history of covenant theology so that you know when we do covenant theology, we're not doing it in some sort of a void. And there's a, there's a history here but that then quickly moves on to kind of walk exegetically through the various covenantal administrations. And that's kind of the, the purpose for the subtitle of the book, you know, Covenant Theology in Scripture. I wanted, wanted to have a book that was not taking the covenantal systems of previous generations as the, the leading edge, uh, but rather that was wanting to see in the scriptures, from the scriptures, this 
covenantal redemption that, that God has accomplished for his people. Uh, so that, that was kind of the, the beginning motivation, wanting to have a kind of a, a, a current exegetically based, biblically based covenant theology. And as I was, it's been kind of a long process getting it from my head on, onto the paper. Uh, and in, in, in that process, uh, one thing that uh, became important to me was to really show that what you, you would think of as say that the unity of the covenant of grace. And I'm sure we'll get to some of these categories in a minute, mm -hmm. but you, you have the, the overarching covenant of grace, God's you know, eternal purpose to redeem his people. You have various covenantal administrations, you know, covenant with Abraham, covenant with Moses, Israel, these sorts of things. Uh, and in, in a lot of covenant theology being written today, the, the validity, the reality of that overarching covenant of grace is uh, either neglected or uh, downplayed. And I really wanted to, to bring out the, the way in which the, the one single unified covenant of grace stretches over all of redemptive history uh, and lays out for us this uh, account of how God has redeemed his people and brought them to himself uh, that I think ho hopefully is um, a, a something of a unique emphasis uh, to, to the book that will be, uh, I hope and pray, helpful to, to God's people as they have opportunity to read it. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and assuming some people might be listening to our show for the first time, we do talk a lot about covenant theology, especially lately, but um, just to kind of quote you in the book and further uh, clarify this for, for us, it's just to, to, to define covenant. So you say a covenant is a binding relationship between parties that involves both blessings and obligations. So with that definition, could you maybe clarify just for definition's sake for the audience more about what really just, a, what is a covenant in, in that, in the light of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an instance where uh, de definitions are, are, are so important and a lot of times we can take words or concepts like covenant and assume we know what they mean without really thinking about what they mean. And if you, if you look at some you know, covenant theologians, particularly in the 20th century, their, their definition of covenant is really determinative for the system of covenant theology that they lay out. You know, what, what you understand a covenant to be is, is very important. And so you know, in, in the book, I you know, try to pretty quickly, pretty early on, laid out exactly what a covenant is. Uh, and as you read there, uh, I, I define a covenant as a, a binding relationship between parties that involves both blessings and obligations. There's a something of a, a disagreement, debate, however you want to phrase it, amongst covenant theologians about uh, whether a covenant should be understand, understood as a relationship or as a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I want to highlight is that it's, it's both, uh, and neither one denigrates the reality and the power of the other one. Uh, so it, uh, a covenant is a relationship. Uh, it's a relationship between parties in this you know, relationship between God and his people, uh, but it is a relationship within parameters. There are um, you know, rules <laughs> to it. There, there are, um, there are, uh, fences set around the relationship and there you know, the 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 parallel can be overdone but th there's a parallel between covenant understood this way and the institution of marriage uh, a marriage is both a relationship and a contract you know it's undeniably a relationship there's you know your you the husband and wife are uh, in a, a vital uh, relationship with each other very personal uh, but there are also rules around that relationship uh, that kind of define the parameters of that relationship. Uh, the fact that uh, there are rules around my relationship with my wife doesn't mean that it's not a, a personal relationship. And the fact that it's a personal relationship doesn't mean that there aren't rules about what, uh, what is and is not done. Um, you know, it's a, it's a binding relationship in that way. It's, uh, it's a relationship that's set within parameters. And it, it's the same with, with covenant. Uh, it's, it's a relationship uh, that has these um, rules, these parameters set around it. And those parameters end up having both 
blessings and obligations. Uh, blessings are brought through the covenant, but it also places obligations on the parties to it. So it's this relationship, and I think that's in a lot of ways something of the emphasis of the book, uh, that it is a, a relationship between God and his people, but it's a relationship set within these parameters <laughs> that God himself has established. So you talk about the, the covenant of grace and like you really want to emphasize how the covenant of grace spans across redemptive history. So what, how would you distinguish your understanding of this, maybe versus like a dispensationalist where they might see the same covenants, but they don't see the unity between these covenants. How, like, what is that unity? You talk about the covenant of grace. What is that covenant of grace unity across all these covenants? Well, let's say... Um... Uh, a pretty pretty important question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, certainly, um, you kind of had a, and I'm, I'll, I'll answer it in kind of two yeah. stages. One, you kind of traditionally you have a, a distinction made between dispensationalism and covenant theology, where dispensationalism might see some of the same, what a, a covenant guy might call covenantal administrations. Uh -huh. you know, dispensationalism will see, you know, God has a interacts with Abraham, he interacts with Moses, you know, there, there are these similar sorts of uh, interactions, yeah. but dispensationalism sees them as very self-contained, that, that God is, um, you know, entering into these relationships with these people and having a, a period of testing whereby uh, this person or group of people uh, does or does not uh, meet the test, they inevitably fail, and so it kind of moves to the next dispensation. Uh, covenant theology uh, traditionally has emphasized that all of these relationships, uh, God's dealings with Abraham, his dealings with Israel through Moses, his dealings through David, that all of these are part of uh, a, an ongoing work of redemption. So when you, when you move from a relationship with Abraham to a relationship with Moses uh, or relationship with Moses to relationship with David, it isn't because the previous uh, relationship has failed, but rather it's because God is moving forward his unfolding plan of redemption. Uh, that's kind of the, the traditional difference between um, dispensationalism and covenant theology. Uh, one of the kind of the, the second part to that answer is, you know, when you ask why I say that I want to highlight the unity of the covenant of grace uh, is, is because it seems in uh, many uh, even kind of reformed uh, understand or treatments of covenant theology, it's kind of assumed that there's a covenant of grace mm -hmm. and other things are administrations of the covenant of grace, but there, there's very little emphasis on the actual unity that's, uh, that's tying them all together, uh, that, that's making them part of one uh, redemptive uh, plan. Uh, and so I think you, you'll, you'll find even, you'll, you'll find, uh, covenant theology books that'll look at the Abrahamic covenant, they'll look at the Mosaic covenant, they'll look at the Davidic covenant, they'll look at the new covenant, they'll go through all the covenantal administrations, but never actually look at the covenant of grace as the covenant of grace, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how, how all of these are being, are being tied together. Hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned too, um, a metaphor about a puzzle. If you give your children uh, a puzzle to put together, do you remember that uh, analogy where you could explain yeah yeah um i compare it and i guess i'll uh back up just just a, a little bit that uh i don't mean to be fall, falling under the trap of using terminology that doesn't doesn't make sense uh, <laughs> that you you know in 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 covenant theology uh, we have uh the the covenant of works and the covenant of grace and we can talk more about you know some of those things if, if you like but in, in the covenant of grace, we have God's eternal purpose to redeem a people and bring them to himself. Uh, that's his unchanging eternal purpose. Now, he, he accomplishes that purpose through covenantal relationships with people and groups of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he, he makes a, a promise of redemption to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 3.15. He enters into a, a relationship with Noah he enters into a relationship with Abraham. He enters into a relationship with Moses and Israel through Moses. Then we have the Davidic co the covenant with David, and then the new covenant that's promised by the prophets and then is inaugurated uh, by Jesus Christ 
And it's through these different covenantal administrations that the overarching eternal work of redemption is both revealed and accomplished. And the, the, the way that I sometimes explain how, it kind of, kind of give a, a way to see how this works is to compare it to a, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, a jigsaw puzzle uh, has one big picture that it's wanting to reveal, but it's made up of individual pieces that have just a piece of that larger picture. And so we can think of the covenant of grace as the big puzzle picture and each of the covenantal administrations as one of the puzzle pieces. You know, each puzzle piece is distinctive. You know, it has the little round parts and the little you know, square parts that you know, fit into the notches and pegs of the next puzzle piece. And so each piece of the puzzle or each covenantal administration is distinctive. Uh, it's not like any other one. Uh, and yet its purpose is not to stand out as distinctive. Uh, its fundamental purpose is to fit into the pieces next to it to reveal the whole picture of the puzzle. So we have these different covenantal administrations. They're all different. They're, they're unique. Uh, some emphasize obedience, some emphasize faith, some emphasize you know, different parts of God's ongoing covenantal work. And that's important for us to, to understand, uh, to, to know about. But fundamentally, the purpose of each puzzle piece is not to be its own distinct piece. Its purpose is to fit into the puzzle and show us this wondrous picture of God's redemptive work. Uh, that, that's how they all, in their distinctiveness, <laughs> fit together into a, a, a beautiful unity. And it, it's that unity that I think we really need to, uh, need to understand because it, it shows us the, the glory of our God, uh, what he's been doing, the love that he has for his people, the security we can have in him, all these uh, wonderful things. That actually, that is a perfect segue. So the, the question I had, maybe more nitty gritty, um, but a little bit of an overview to just, just to whet the appetite. So if people are hearing, it's like, okay, covenant of grace is throughout Old Testament, it just unifies this, but there's obviously covenant of works. Um, it's given to Abraham, it's given to Adam in the garden. We see something of it in Moses. We're not really sure what that is. This is something in the New Testament. So how, maybe kind of a broad overview, how you understand scripturally the covenant of grace throughout each of these covenants so maybe adamic the noahic abrahamic um, mosaic davidic and then into to, to christ maybe a quick overview of how you see this string through maybe just to whet the appetite for what people can read in the book yeah well peter that's uh that's that's kind of the substance of, of the book there <laughs> yeah uh, I'll, I'll try to give you a, um a, a quick a quick tour through yeah, um, the, the click notes version. Uh, if, if, I guess if those are still around. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but my understanding, uh -huh. uh, I trust it is from from the scriptures, is that in in eternity, uh, you know, you can't really speak of time in relation to, but to, to eternity, but you know, in eternity past, so to speak, in eternity prior to the creation of time, uh, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, entered into, if you want to speak loosely there, uh, there's this eternal intra-Trinitarian covenant in which God purposes the redemption of his people. Uh, the, uh, the elect are given to the Son, the Son covenants to, to win their salvation, the Spirit covenants to apply that salvation to God's people. Uh, the, the redemption of God's people is guaranteed, secured in this pre-temporal, eternal, inter-Trinitarian covenant. You know, sometimes it's called the covenant of redemption. Uh, sometimes it's called the council of peace. Uh, you know, there, there are reasons for some different terminology, but that's mm -hmm. you're not really important here. Uh, you know, in eternity, God has purposed the, 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 the redemption of his people. Now, in, uh, in the beginning of creation, God enters into this covenant of works with Adam. Uh, he promises uh, Adam, uh, you know, creates Adam in his image, puts him in this garden, provides all of his need. Uh, we Sometimes uh, the covenant of works gets uh, kind of presented as a, as a cold covenant, kind of a cold legalistic relationship between God and Adam. And it, it's really anything but that. It's this beautiful picture of God's relationship with his image bearer in the perfect Eden that he had created for him. Uh, but the, the terms of this covenant of works are that Adam is to render 
perfect and personal obedience, the Westminster Confession says. And so Adam has to obey God's command. Mm -hmm. And there's this focused emphasis on the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, Adam, uh, of course, fails uh, to uh, render this obedience. Uh, because of that, he is under the curse of the covenant of works, which is death. Immediately upon uh, pronouncing this, uh, still in Genesis 3, you know, as the curse is announced, uh, in Genesis 3.15, God promises uh, that he will send one who will crush the head of the serpent. Uh, that he will send one effectively to, to redeem his people, uh, to, to destroy the enemy of the souls of his people. And this is understood to be uh, the first, sometimes referred to as the, the first offer of the gospel or the first preaching of the gospel that he, God here is promising to send a Messiah. Uh, and it's faith in this promise uh, that uh, is from there forward redeeming God's people. You see both Adam and Eve showing evidence uh, of faith in this promise. Uh, Adam names his wife Eve saying she's the mother of all the living. Uh, when Eve has children, she names them uh, after this idea of a seed, that she has a man from the Lord, that the Lord has replaced the seed, that she, she's seeing, uh, she's looking to the fulfillment of this promise. Well, that promise to provide a redeemer, the promise to redeem his people, that, that's the substance of the covenant of grace. Well, as we move forward from that you know, offer of the gospel, that uh, kind of, that, that first offer of the substance of the covenant of grace in Genesis 3, you move into Genesis 6, uh, God's interaction with Noah kind of continues up through Genesis 9. And in, in that covenantal unfolding, you see God showing the reality of his covenantal promises. Uh, it, gets, it gets into a lot of uh, explanation, understanding what's happening with Noah, but especially in light of the way that later uh, the apostle Peter reflects back on Noah Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's evident that, that what's happening in the Noahic covenant is God is showing his power really to unravel all of creation. Uh, he, he can bring judgment now. He can, uh, he can uh, bring about judgment now, but he's withholding it because he wants to redeem his people. Uh, he, he, he wants to change the hearts of his people. He wants to make them his own. And so he is withholding judgment for the purpose of gathering in this people, for the purpose of realizing his covenant of grace. Now you then move to Abraham. Uh, the big thing we see with Abraham is God disclosing something of the kind of the way that the mechanics of how that salvation will work. Uh, when we see the life of Abraham and then later, particularly the Apostle Paul's reflections on that, uh, we see with Abraham that it is through faith that God's people are counted righteous. Uh, that's the, the, the way that the redemption of God's covenant of grace will work. His people will be saved through faith. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get to Moses, uh, the covenant with Israel, uh, the Sinaitic covenant, sometimes called, I tend to call it the Mosaic covenant. Uh, there we see God laying out what life as his people looks like, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, particularly in the, in the Ten Commandments. Uh, th these aren't rules that we follow to be saved, but being God's people, the, this is how we live out something of his character in the midst of this world. Uh, he's using Israel as a, as he calls them, uh, a, a nation of priests, uh, that they are showing God's glory uh, through their lives to the world around them. This is what life as God's people redeemed by faith looks like. Well, then when you get to, to the, the covenant with David, uh, we see the importance of the work of a mediator, uh, that God's dealings with his people will be mediated through a mediator. Uh, there will be one who will represent uh, God's covenantal work amongst his people, pointing, of course, to the Lord Jesus. When you get to the new covenant, and we see God promising this, uh, to this covenant that will work uh, in the hearts of his people, that will bring about this heart obedience. It's not necessarily anything new. As far back as Deuteronomy, we have you know, calls for the Israelites to circumcise their hearts it's always been an internal work, but God is highlighting the internal spiritual work, the spiritual power uh, of his covenant of grace through the new covenant uh, that foretold in the prophets and then inaugurated uh, by the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, bringing his people into this present time foretaste uh, of our eternal dwelling with him 
uh, that covenantal salvation that's realized as we see so beautifully in, say, Revelation 21 and 22, uh, where you have God's people with him forever. Uh, that's a kind of a, a, a quick overview, uh, but you know, we, we see throughout these things that, that God never is doing something different. Uh, he's had this purpose before, uh, I say, you know, before Genesis 1-1. So in, in, in Genesis 1-0, uh, God has had this purpose and he has been working gradually to unfold it uh, and to bring his people to himself. And I, I think that that's, that's part of the, uh, if uh, not ta taxing you with a long answer here, uh, <laughs> that, that's part of the, the, the intimacy of seeing the overarching covenant of mm -hmm. grace. God has a, a people. Uh, and, and he's showing himself, showing his people what he's like, and he's showing his people what they're like. Uh, and that's, you know, in, in, in my life, God has shown me who he is. He has shown me things about myself that I most often didn't want to know. Uh, but he, he, has, he has done that with me personally. He's done that with y'all personally. Uh, but he's also, he also has a, a, a people, and, and he's doing that with his people, the church. And so you see this long account of God essentially be, being patient with his people, uh, showing them who he is, showing them who they are, showing them what it means to be his people. Uh, and that's a, a, a richness of God's relationship with his people that we, we can miss if we, if, we, uh, if we don't bear in mind this overarching, uh, supra-historical aspect of, of God's covenant of grace. Love it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, overview of your, of your book. And I, I do that because I know people are going to hear this and are like, oh, I want to learn more about the Noahic. I want to learn more about the Mosaic and how is he distinguishing these things? And I think it's helpful to hear both the continuity, so how this stays the same across covenants, but also I think people do want to know how do these specific covenants, but uh, you explain this in your book, how do these specific covenants play into understanding of the covenant of grace? Um, and so I hope that uh, once people's appetite is like, oh, I need to, I need to learn more how these covenants point us to this overarching covenant. Mm. Yeah, I do. I, you know, I, I do go through and, and look at each of the, of the covenantal administrations in detail. And yeah. uh, if, if, if you get a chance to look at the book, you might cry uncle and say, maybe this is too much detail about uh, <laughs> each, each of the covenants. Um, but yeah, no, no such thing. <laughs> there's, there's not there's not there's not too much detail this is yeah it's it's good and it's it's a short enough book i think too where people can get through whatever it's 350 400 pages and not bog down with 1300 1400 pages or multiple volumes over these covenants but a, a good concise summary of what these are mm -hmm. yeah quick quick question and and comment too is earlier you were talking about a, a marriage and it really is helpful explaining a covenant and even a, and a, even a wedding ceremony. And I was immediately thinking of how we as the church are the bride of Christ. So maybe that kind of helps explain it too. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So there, that was just kind of a comment on, on my end. And then a question too would be somebody looking to get this book, enter into this book, what would be some helpful, if any, prerequisite knowledge stepping into it? Well, I was, my in, intention in, in writing it, uh, and I hope and, and pray that that was accomplished, is that basically if, if, you, if you are interested enough for reading a book on covenant theology to sound appealing to you, then, then you have the level of knowledge that's necessary to, to pick it up and read it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I try to, I, I don't want to, you know, shy away from any technical discussion or any of, of the important details of covenant theology. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't do that. I don't, I don't avoid talking about, you know, an intra-Trinitarian covenant or uh, how we understand uh, the, the, the particulars of the Mosaic covenant or, yeah, you know, all the, all the, the thorny issues of covenant theology. I don't, I don't avoid them. I deal with, with all of them, but I try to, you know, take things slowly, explain terms as I go. Uh, and so my, my hope, and I, I think it's uh, hopefully has been met is that, like I say, if you're, if, if reading a book on covenant theology doesn't immediately make you turn around and, and walk out of the room, <laughs> yeah. then, 
you, I think you have the, the, the level of uh, knowledge necessary to, to start on page one and, and work your way through. Cool. And, and there's a there's a chapter in your book, too, that I kind of want to dive into um, that I haven't seen in any covenant theology book that I've read before. Uh, and it's chapter 14, Covenant Theology and the Church. So how does how does our understanding of covenant theology actually influence the church itself and the worship service, the preach word? How does how does this system of reference the Bible proposes to us? How does it actually affect the church? Well, it uh, you know, as I you know kind of lay out uh, in the in the book, it, it it's through covenant theology that we come to know God better and to understand ourselves as his people better. And so that then ends up having untold implications for, for the life and practice of the church, mm -hmm. uh, kind of what we're doing as his people, uh, how we're living, how we're relating with each other, these sorts of things. Uh, and in, in that particular chapter, I deal specifically with uh, one of the, one of those thorny issues that comes up in covenant theology, and that's the, the issue of the sacraments. You know, how does covenant theology shape our understanding of, of the sacraments? And of course, the, you know, the elephant in the room there is baptism. <laughs> yeah. uh, how, does, how does it shape our understanding of baptism? How does it shape our understanding of the Lord's Supper? Uh, and all of it based off of what we've seen of what it means to be God's people throughout all the previous covenantal administrations. You know, in, in the book, that comes at the very end after a we've looked at the, the way that covenant works in the new Testament. So it's kind of a, at the end of the, at the end of all of this thinking about mm -hmm. what it means to be God's people in light of what we've learned, how does that filter into issues within the church um, as we seek to live out faithfully as God's covenant people today. And maybe diving into that a little bit further too, before we, before we wrap up the time. Um, so you talked about the covenant of theology, covenant theology in the New Testament. And I think a lot of us see, oh, the covenant of works is the Old Testament. I'm not terribly sure how it affects the New Testament. Um, or some people might even say, okay, I see something of the covenant of grace in the Old Testament. I'm not even sure how it's in the uh, New, uh, Old Testament, but definitely in the New Testament. Um, so how, how does covenant theology, knowing that most of these covenants are seen in the Old Testament, the Noahic, Davidic, all that stuff, how, how do we understand this? in light of the new testament how it kind of develops this but also kind of pushing that further into the church how do, how do we see this in the new testament developed there and then pushed into like what you said how we how we understand the church that that is uh it's, it's a an excellent observation uh we, we we tend to think of covenant covenant theology is a new testament concept but all the covenants seemingly are most at least mostly in the old testament yeah um but i think what what we see interestingly in in the new testament is we see both jesus and the apostles doing covenant theology uh, and that doesn't mean that we see them saying things teaching things that we now organize as covenant theology it yeah. means that we see jesus and the apostles using covenant theology categories to explain god's redemptive work uh, you see christ doing this at, at the last supper uh, speaking of his current work, his ongoing work as the blood of the new covenant. Uh, you see Paul doing it uh, in places like Romans 5, uh, where he takes the, the whole sweep of God's redemptive history and brings it under the, this comparison of Christ and Adam uh, and the, the work that they are doing as covenant heads. Uh, and so in, in, in these sorts of ways, it, covenant theology in the New Testament helps us think about who our God is, the redemption that he has accomplished, how we understand our own redemption, uh, how we offer salvation to others. Uh, it, it, it shows us God and his redemptive purposes better, and that, that shapes the, the, the way that we live out the Christian life. Hmm. We, then, we then interestingly see in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul again brings up this parallel between Christ and Adam, hmm. and he has this the fascinating discussion. We, when we think about 1 Corinthians 15, if you know, what might come to mind is that it's kind of the great resurrection chapter, wow. and a, uh, a powerful uh, opening of what the resurrection is, uh, what it will be for us. 
uh, and, and kind of nestled right kind of toward the first half of the chapter, Paul has this fascinating discussion of the son handing over the kingdom to the father uh, at the end and God being all in all. Uh, and what I try to do, in, and it can be a, a, a tricky passage, a, a mm. confusing passage in some ways, but what I try to do in the, in the book is open up that passage and show how what, what actually is happening here uh, is that we're, Paul is describing the glories of Christ's return uh, as in, in, in covenantal categories. It, it is the realization of the purposes established in the Council of Peace, the Covenant of Redemption, uh, so that not only as we understand our current life as Christians, but even as we look forward to the blessed hope that we have, uh, it's, it's a covenantal hope hope. Uh, that's, uh, it, it's shaped by what we've been shown of God through the covenant of grace. And then again, we see the same sort of thing in Revelation 21 and 22, uh, where the, the, the New Jerusalem uh, is a, a, a covenantal place. Uh, it, it's a place where the covenant of grace is realized in its full splendor. And so, you know, again, long answer, but, you know, in the New Testament, we see covenant theology shaping the way that redemption is understood uh, the way that we anticipate uh, the life to come. Uh, and so th th these are things that are, that are real realities uh, for God's people today. It's not just, not just in the Old Testament. So maybe just to, to wrap that up, it sounds like uh, in the Old Testament, these covenants are systematically, not explained systematically in the sense of just propositions, but it's through history that it is explained. And the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles assume that we've read the old testament that we know that these covenants exist and they're just they're living and they're doing church they're explaining this is how the church is administrated with the assumption that we already know that these categories exist in the old testament which is why they don't explicitly say okay here's this covenant here's this covenant it's just assumed in the life of the church is that is that a is that a right way of saying this yes yeah I, I think so okay yeah, and another cool thing that you mentioned that I was thinking of is how the new Eden is going to be the covenant of grace fulfilled to its fullest. Just as the beginning of the Bible, you know, you have the Garden of Eden pre-fall, just the covenant of works existing. Now the new Eden in the end is going to be the fullest of the covenant of grace. Yeah, I think when, 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 when we have those kinds of categories, when we, we kind of see what God has been doing, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't read Revelation 21 and 22 and not be moved yeah. anyway. anyway. Uh, but when you, when you get all of the, the things that are being assumed, as, as you said, Peter, uh, and so the, the, the full meaning of what all is being communicated, it just, uh, it, it takes what already is a, a powerful section of scripture and it just um it, it makes it uh, breathtaking uh the 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 beauty of the redemption that awaits uh, the children of god hmm. yeah and even even in your book as we're talking about it the the first 11 chapters or so are, are really kind of focused on the old testament uh how the covenants are displayed and then from chapters 12 to 14 it's three chapters on the the covenants explained in the life of the church um, and maybe just as kind of a wrap up thing for, for those who are either under non reform preaching or reform preaching, non covenantal preaching, how does, how does this affect the preach word to people sitting in church Sunday after Sunday, hearing the message? What, not maybe what distinctives, but when covenant theology is assumed and that's the doctrine, that's the system of, uh, of interpreting scripture, how does that change preaching and how does that change preaching to God's people? Well, I think that it has a you know a, a number of effects. One, I think it it really opens up the Old Testament as Christian scripture. Uh, that that God, what He's doing in the Old Testament, it it is immediately relevant to His people today because He's still the God of the covenant, and we're still the people of the covenant. Now, redemption has unfolded since then, uh, but the the Old Testament is as much covenant of grace scripture mm. as Romans is. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the one hand, it really opens up a, a preaching of the Old Testament for God's people now, not just a bunch of, you know, morality lessons, uh, but but the way that God deals with his people. And that, that as 
Paul himself says in First Corinthians is that these things were written for us. These things mm. in the Old Testament are written for us. Uh, and I think it's so it opens up the Old Testament <clears throat> that. And then in the New Testament, it you know, it, it, bring, it just brings a, a richness to our understanding of who God is uh, and what he's doing in the midst of his people, uh, that, that he is uh, the God who has been at work doing these things from before the foundations of the earth, and that he has been bringing to himself this people of whom we are blessed uh, graciously to be a part. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that changes the way that we see our brothers and our sisters around us. Uh, it makes the, the, the preaching of the New Testament uh, richer out of its Old Testament background. Um, I think it, uh, it really just opens up the scriptures uh, to be preached from Genesis to Revelation uh, as the revelation of God's dealing with his one covenant people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, li I like how you end with covenant theology in the church after building understanding of the unity of scripture throughout these different covenants that unfold and how that actually affects kind of the day-to-day -day ground. Here's here's how the church works. How's, here's how the church functions as a covenant community, um, expositing the scriptures, giving the sacraments. But yeah, I think, I, I hope it's a, it's a great um, reassurance to God's people that people read this understand the covenants better, see the unity in the covenants better, and then leads them ultimately to a greater understanding. Okay, this is what scripture's saying. This is who God is to me, who God is to God's people. That, that, that's certainly my prayer as well. Um, I hope that the, the prayer that the Lord will, will bless it to, to be a comfort to, to God's people, to show them something more of the splendor of, of their God. Um, that, that's my, my great prayer. And certainly I have seen the... Um, Prior to being a, a professor, I was a pastor of a uh, Reformed congregation, uh, and you know, pre preaching these things out of God's Word, it, it, it does it, it opens up um, the beauty of, of God and of His redemption to God's people. This isn't mm -hmm. just an academic thing to haggle over, um, but but this this is of real uh, comfort, real spiritual food to God's people. Um, I'm not saying that it's that because because of the way I handle it, <laughs> yeah. because it, it, it it's, it's scripture, uh, and hopefully it, it will be used uh, to some of those ends hmm. uh, in, in years to come. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, Dr. Myers. It's been it's been a blessing having you on and, and describing your book, uh, and hopefully we can have you on later if there's anything that you have kind of in the works. If you got any projects coming up, I don't know if you want to talk to people about if you have anything that you're that you're working on right now that people can look forward to after this book. Well, we'll 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 see what the, what the Lord has. I have a couple ideas, but um, we'll 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 see, we'll see what what the Lord has. Sounds good. But I really appreciate y'all uh, having me on. Uh, it's, it's been a real delight to to talk with y'all. Great. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.